So thank you everyone for joining us today for um, our CPD session on understanding the adolescent brain and supporting our teenagers with emotions. My name is Ellis Blythe. I'm an assistant psychologist uh, with the Psychology and Schools team. And joining me today is Dr. Beth Mosley. Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Beth Mosley. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist working for NSFT and I'm the lead for the Psychology and Schools team. So we do a lot of work into schools across Suffolk. Perfect. So today's session, um, what we're hoping to cover, if you could move to the next slide, please, Beth. Um, we're going to have a look at what adolescence is. What is this uh, period of time where our young people seem to change so much? We're going to look at the teenage brain in a bit more detail. So why it's so amazing and what the implications are for, for what's going on in the brain um, on the presentation of our young people in schools. And then we're going to look at what, as school staff, we need to try and remember. Um, looking at a focus of, of why these brain changes and, and the, the things that happen during adolescence, why that's important to, to recognise um, in young people in our schools. And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, we're going to look at how uh, we can help. So we're going to provide ideas to you about how you can help to support young people um, in your schools that are going through this rocky and turbulent time of, of development. Thank you, Beth. So what is adolescence? Well, it's a, uh, it's a period of, of development, which occurs often between the ages of 12 and 24. Um, many people think that adolescence sort of stops at 18 when you become an adult, but actually the, the changes that happen during adolescence continue until our mid twenties. Um, it's a unique period of, of biological development. So I'm sure we're all aware of, of the hormone changes that happen um, in our bodies, all those physiological changes that we commonly associate with, um, with puberty. And it's a unique period of social development as well. So we often see um, adolescents wanting to take a step away from uh, their parents and their relationship with their parents might change. They might try to find more agency in their life and, and try to be a bit more independent. And often alongside this independence becomes uh, there's a greater influence of, of peer relations as well. So we might see young people expanding their, their social groups or developing uh, deeper and stronger friendships uh, with their peers. And perhaps most importantly, and something we're going to cover today, is the psychological and, and neurological changes that occur during, during this period of adolescence. Now on the slide, there's, there's two quotes, and I think it's important to recognize um, that actually, the presentations we associate with adolescence have been around for thousands of years. We often hear people say, back in my day, teenagers weren't like that, they were respectful um, and all these sorts of things. But actually, Socrates, a very famous philosopher, um, wrote over 2000 years ago uh, that adolescents have bad manners, they have contempt for authority, show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. And I think uh, these are all very common common traits that we see with adolescents today, and I'm sure we'd be able to recognize in ourselves back when, back when we were adolescents. Aristotle gives uh, another view in that teenagers are passionate, irascible, and apt to be carried away by their impulses. And it's the age when people are most devoted to their friends. So I suppose this um, is a little bit more of a positive spin on adolescence, and it also emphasizes uh, that striving for independence and sort of the expansion of, of social circles where young people going through this, this period of development um, seem to look to their friends for, for more support um, in their lives. So, Dan Siegel is a, is a famous American psychiatrist um, and he came up with, with this idea that adolescence is a period of life with the most power for courage and creativity. Um, and I think this gives a really nice positive outlook on, on adolescence in that during this time, um, teenagers often find themselves uh, having a, a little bit more courage to try new things. Uh, they might change their way of thinking. Um, so they might have views that, that are different to when they were younger, different ideas might become more apparent during this time. Um, and they just generally seem to have a bit more of a strive for life. And that's partly down to the neural circuitry that we'll look into a bit later. Um, I think it's quite important as well to remember 
that a 15 year old, for example, isn't just a 10 year old with five years more experience. So if we, if I think myself sort of back to five years ago, I can see some changes in my life. I can see how I've developed in some areas, but the changes are minimal compared to when I was 15 and comparing myself to when I was 10. We have lots of changes socially, uh, neurologically, psychologically, that really impact the way that we live our lives. So we might not have the same sort of relationship with our parents. We might not use them as, as such a support network and rather use them as a safe base to come back to if we're feeling uh, like we need that support. But we might strive for, for more independence, as, as I've said before. So it's important to recognise that the changes um, in this time period are actually quite large. Um, and it's not the case of just an extra year, but actually that year can be a huge period of development um, for our young people going through uh, these changes of adolescence. So we've got another slide eh, uh, for you, if you don't mind answering for us. So I guess a little bit of self-reflection. What stands out for you about your own adolescence? Um, and I've given you the quotes from Socrates and Aristotle to say that teenagers weren't that different 2000 years ago. So I'm expecting to see um, sort of some of those answers that we would expect for teenagers. Uh, but what really stands out for you about your own adolescence? Thanks, yeah, definitely. Um, I think we can all agree with that. It's, it can be a, a confusing time, which probably leads into that uh, anxiety as well. Moodiness, so sort of potentially mood swings as well, wanting to be with friends, so really striving for those, those social interactions and, and trying new things. So that's having the courage to, to try different things that we might not have done before. Um, overwhelming emotions, absolutely, and we'll, we'll look into a little bit more about why that's the case um, next few slides. Very moody, lots of arguments with my mum. So again, the changes in relationships that we see sort of during this time period are, are quite stark. Um, total lack of confidence is quite interesting. Um, so that's something that we will look into a little bit more as well in the next couple of slides. Um, anger, being quite self-conscious, questioning things. So again, adapting a different way of thinking and, and wondering, you know, how is the world working? Is that right? Um, frustration, pushing boundaries, argumentative. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answers there. Uh, it's really useful to get some insight. Um, we've got a few more coming in. So not fitting in with friends, having self-doubt, uh, having risk, doing the opposite of what's expected. So that's sort of a, a quite stereotypical thing we associate with, with adolescents, sort of rebelling against authority almost, and sort of the social norms. Um, yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you, Beth. So a good way of trying to understand all of these different things that happen during adolescence is by looking at the brain. And the brain is a very, very complex organ, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you a massively detailed explanation now because we could go on forever. Um, but there's a really nice piece of imagery called the brain house um, and a really nice illustration on your right here that's been done by Dr. Hazel Harrison. And it splits the brain into sort of two floors of a house, essentially. So the upstairs part of the brain is uh, what we'd call the prefrontal cortex. So it's a bit of your brain just behind your forehead. Um, it's the, the part of the brain that we've developed uh, more recently in evolutionary terms. And it's, uh, it's quite different to, it's the thing that sets it aside, I guess, from, from the animals. And it's much more developed compared to other mammals. This part of the brain um, helps us with planning, organizing, problem solving, flexibility of thought, and also with sort of logical and reasoned thought as well. And we'd often coin these uh, thinking skills executive function. So this upstairs part of the brain is, is really quite important. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's a staircase that links it to the downstairs part of the brain. And this downstairs part of the brain is something called our limbic system. So it's right at the, the middle of our brain. It's, it's sort of the brain stem that, that comes up sort of at the base of the neck. Um, it connects to things called the hippocampus, the, the hypothalamus. Um, and the amygdala. So these uh, parts of the brain are, are really important for survival. So the hypothalamus controls like our temperature regulation. Um, the amygdala, as it says here, is, is really concerned about safety and our fight or flight response. Um, and these parts of the brain are what 
we would have had sort of in our very early evolutionary stages. So you see these uh, parts of the brain very prominent in animals still. Um, and they would have been very important for us uh, millions of years ago when we were hunter gatherers, we were looking for food and we might have come across things like saber toothed tigers on a, on a regular basis. So the amygdala would, would sense a threat such as a predator. Um, it would sort of flip on, get some adrenaline pumping around our body, make our hearts beat a bit quicker and sort of push a lot of oxygen and glucose around so that our muscles can respond to the threat. And that would either be for fighting and sort of fighting the threat off or, or running away in order to, to see another day. And it was really important. It's how as a species we, we survived. Um, I guess the issue is that in today's world, we see less threats of that sort of level. We don't generally walk down the street and see something like a tiger staring us in the face. Um, but the amygdala hasn't really changed much. So it will respond to, to threats that maybe um, aren't as dangerous as, as it thinks it is, um, or it might just respond at maybe inappropriate times. So this is where the upstairs part of the brain becomes really important. So that staircase allows communication between both parts. So it helps the, the upstairs part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex can communicate and calm down that amygdala and let it know that actually things are okay. Um, if I saw a dog coming up to me in the street, the amygdala might start uh, blaring. It might see, you know, uh, it's got four legs, sharp teeth, salivating. Uh, what if it bites me? What if it barks at me? But actually the prefrontal cortex might say, well, it's on a lead. I've seen this dog before. I've stroked it before. Generally, dogs nowadays are not quite as much of a threat as they might have used to have been sort of evolutionary in evolutionary terms. Uh, so the prefrontal cortex really helps to calm that down. Now, Dan Siegel, who I mentioned earlier, came up with the idea of flipping your lid. And this is quite prominent in adolescence because of how the brain is, is being organized at this time. So what you can see there is the upstairs part of the brain is flipped off from the downstairs part. Obviously, this doesn't happen sort of physically. Our brain doesn't detach itself, uh, but it makes it more difficult for those uh, messages to be passed from the upstairs to the downstairs part of the brain. And the amygdala sort of takes control and goes into overdrive. And we find that a lot of our responses when we flipped our lid are very emotionally driven. Uh, we work a lot on impulse and we um, are in a sort of safety, trying to avoid or fight against threat mode when actually we don't necessarily need to be. And it becomes very difficult then to calm ourselves down and to think more reasoned and logically because that upstairs part of the brain is being flipped and sort of flipping your lid. Uh, thank you, Beth. You have the next slide, please. Perfect. So why is it that adolescents are, I suppose, more vulnerable to this sort of flipping the lid action? Well, during this period, there's a lot of changes going on uh, neurologically. The brain's under construction. And what's going on is that the brain, uh, the neural connections between neurons are being pruned. They're being cut away um, if they aren't any use anymore. So it's a bit like uh, pruning a rose bush, where if you sort of take bits away, uh, it grows back a bit stronger and it, the plant generally remains healthier. Within the brain, removing unused neural connections helps to sort of streamline some of that connectivity and it just helps the brain to work a bit better. Um, we're also going through a period of specialization. So Dan Siegel likes the phrase, uh, use it or lose it. So sort of that repetitive practice of things um, helps to create specialized neural pathways. And this is really prominent in adolescence. So any areas of interest, whether that's sort of musical instruments, athletics, languages, for example, um, our brains are more able to specialize in these areas. So that old phrase, um, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, we know you can, as we get older, we can still learn things. But I suppose a more apt way of looking at it is your best teaching a puppy new tricks because that brain is very plastic, it can uh, mold itself better, the connections are more easily made. Um, so a lot of specializing going on. We also know that there is um, myelin formation going on during adolescence, so it helps to create greater connections between parts of the brain. Um, and it's especially important considering sort of the upstairs downstairs part and that communication that's, that's really important. Um, but this is still forming, so by the time we sort of come out of adolescence, the communication between these two areas is, is much better. But during adolescence, it's, it's not so great. Um, and I guess sort of thinking back to pruning as well, 
Um, this happens from the back to the front of the brain. So the front is the prefrontal cortex where all that higher level thought, the reason thinking, the logical thinking, the planning happens. And during adolescence, this part of the brain is, is really under construction the most. And uh, teenagers find it much more difficult to access um, this part of the brain more regularly or, or to use it at its full capacity. So that's something that we really have to be mindful of um, because this area of the brain is, is still being constructed and streamlined it's not going to be used as effectively by our adolescents and their decisions are more likely to be influenced by their emotions, by the amygdala, by that downstairs part of the brain. And it's something that, again, is, is quite important to be mindful of when we look at how our adolescents behave and, and react to the world around them. Actually, some of that behaviour can be quite well explained by what's happening uh, within their brains. So Dan Siegel um, has put forward the idea of essence as a way of sort of summarizing the changes of an adolescent brain um, that we see sort of in their presentation. So we have emotional spark, social engagement, novelty, and creative exploration. And we're gonna take a look at each one of these in turn and try and see well, what are the, the downfalls of, of these changes, but also what are the upsides of having these uh, changes in the brain at, at this age? So the first one is emotional spark. Um, and really the, the downside of this is that intense emotions can really rule the day. Um, so like I said, a lot of decisions are um, emotion focused. We can see sort of extreme reactivity, lots of moodiness, as, as you mentioned before in, that, in the Slido, um, and lots of impulsivity as well. So I think back to um, the example of sort of breaking up with your first uh, boyfriend or girlfriend when you're sort of in that teenage age and it feels like the end of the world and part of that is due to not experiencing it before but part of it is also that we're very emotionally led and we have this extreme reactivity that actually a lot of the the negative things or even sort of minor inconveniences can really seem like the end of the world and that's just because of how the brain is responding to things that we see as potential threats on the flip side if we're being emotionally led, then life can be filled with lots of energy and it's got a sense of sort of a vital drive. And we're constantly striving to, to meet sort of the pleasure systems of our brain, which can really give us a lot of exuberance and, and zest for life, which is a really nice way of, of thinking about it. I guess as we get out of this adolescent development stage and we move more into adulthood, um, sort of that exuberance and zest for life is something that can diminish a little bit. Uh, compared to our adolescence, we don't find ourselves being quite as adventurous or, or trying new things. Um, so that's an important thing to think about. The next area that, that Dan Siegel mentions is social engagement. Um, and teens can become quite preoccupied with peer relations. Um, as I mentioned before, the parental relationships are, are very likely to change during adolescence. and There's much more to focus on, on developing friendship with peers. Um, and this can also be seen sort of evolutionary as well. If we think of animals sort of in their teenage years, um, often you'll find them grouping together for safety. Um, so they're less likely to be eaten by a predator. And the same sort of responses are, are still happening in our brains. You might not be completely aware and conscious of it, but it's something that our brains have learned to do to keep us safe. And sort of being excluded from, from groups can feel really sort of life-threatening to, to teenagers because there's such a, a sense of importance on, on social groups and social acceptance. Um, I guess a, a, a knock-on effect of having quite a lot of importance on social engagement is actually there's an increased risk of, of risk-taking behaviour um, because obviously with, with peer pressure that can make things a bit more difficult um, and the need for social acceptance can be more important um, than anything else. So adolescents might be hypersensitive to social exclusion. They might avoid social risk um, because they're sort of striving for that acceptance. The upside, I suppose, is that adolescents um, have more peer connectedness and they create new friendships. So there'll be lots of, of new relationships forming between adolescents, um, which, is, which is mostly all positive. The drive for social connection leads to the creation of supportive relationships. Um, so sort of expanding our support network beyond the initial core of our, of our main caregiver 
um, is a really positive aspect of our psychology. It, it's a really good predictor of well-being, uh, longevity and, and happiness throughout life. So actually, it's a, it's a really important thing uh, for us to do. And by putting ourselves out there as adolescents and, and trying to build these social connections, we develop social and relational skills. It's, it's how we learn sort of societal norms and what sort of behaviours are accepted socially and what might be frowned upon. Um, and I guess helps set us up for later in life when we're um, you know, building more new relationships. It helps us to, to do that in a, in a better way. Uh, the next aspect is novelty seeking. So we find um, our adolescents often take more risks with their behaviors. Um, they'll often be sort of sensation seeking and they'll more often than not also overemphasize the thrill and downplay the risk. And again, this can be linked back to uh, the, the neurology of the brain where um, the amygdala is sort of in control. It's, it's driving our impulses. It's very important. Uh, for the, the pleasure system of the brain. So we're trying to sort of get this dopamine hit to, to make us feel good and to uh, sort of keep us going and to drive us. And for adolescents, the amount of dopamine they need uh, to get the same feel-good facts that we get uh, is actually more. And so to get more dopamine, they'll have to engage in behaviours that are more risky. Uh, the downside is that if they're not using that logical part of the brain, the, the prefrontal cortex particularly well, then they're not going to really acknowledge the risk necessarily. Um, and that can also play into, into impulsivity. Um, Beth, I think you've gone back a slide there. Thank you. Um, so that can also play into impulsivity where an idea can just become an action without sort of any pause to reflect on the consequences. Um, and again, that also links into to dopamine and trying to get that hit of those feel good uh, chemicals in our brain. Of course, the upside is that um, by having more novelty seeking, adolescents are more open to change and living passionately. They'll uh, seek new opportunities, uh, new interests that can really sort of become a, a fundamental and staple part of our lives moving forward. So, um, you know, things like extreme sports or, or different sorts of exercise a young person might do as, as a novelty seeker or a thrill seek could actually become something that we do throughout adulthood um, and also helps to bring us a sense of adventure, which is which is quite important. And the last area uh, that Dan Siegel mentions is creative exploration. So searching for a meaning of life. Um, I remember someone said in the slide about questioning, uh, questioning what's important and things like that. This can be a downside and it can lead to sort of a crisis of identity, vulnerability, uh, vulnerability to peer pressure, and also a lack of direction and purpose. But on the flip side, um, it can also allow us to experience the ordinary as extraordinary, and it can let us see the world through a new lens. Um, so adolescence is really sort of a, an up and down sort of time, and we, it's, a, it's a set of scales that are never really quite balanced. So we always have a downside to something that we do, but there is an upside as well. Um, so that's sort, of, that's sort of the adolescent brain in a nutshell. Um, next slide is a slide, but I think Beth is, is going to take over from here. So I'll hand you over to Beth. Thank you, Alice. That's great. Hopefully, let me know if my microphone fades in and out, just because um, I've got this new headset. Um, and when I was listening, I was getting, it felt a little bit jittery. Anyway, so a question for you guys and for anyone who's, because we've got more people on than at the very beginning. If you didn't get to log on to slido.com, be great if you could join now because we've got a few questions for you on Slido. So what are some of these areas that you see in your students that create challenges in the school environment? So you might be a parent on this call and some of these challenges may come through at home, but let we're thinking very specifically about school. So if you wouldn't mind typing in giving us some ideas about how you think some of these four key areas or some of the things that Ellis has described about the structure of the brain and the changes of the brain can play out in a school environment and create challenges. Okay, so challenging authority and rules, absolutely refusal. And, and I guess the question is, what's that refusal about? Is it about finding the work too difficult, not wanting to be humiliated in front of friends, becoming disruptive. 
and um, I've worked with many young people in school environments who have got into a pattern of disruptive behaviour. Often um, those young people, when you've got down to it, have actually preferred to be the joke or disruptive member of the class and to be removed from the lesson than to admit in front of their peer group that they're struggling with the, the academic content. So risk taking impulsivity, friendships being paramount, fear of rejection and struggling to manage those extreme emotions. Again, identity, friendship, peer pressure. And I know for many of you, especially if you've got phones in school sometimes, that the issues that you're dealing with in the school day are very much around managing the tensions in friendship groups and how quickly young people can move from having a fantastic day to having a devastating day or being part of a friendship group and then everything's gone wrong and everything's a tragedy and it can be really difficult to be patient with young people when they get into those states and I know at Thurston where we worked we we have a room where quite often vulnerable young people would come at lunchtime and at break times and it would be fascinating to see their progress through the day and see some of the challenge they faced and the patience of the, the adults in that space to really listen to young people's struggles with their friendship group and kind of help them think those things through and build, bring back that uh, prefrontal cortex, get that staircase back intact. Not seeing the big picture, absolutely. And we know that young people, adolescent brains are very much built to be in the here and now and not be forward focused, which is really difficult, isn't it? When we think about what the pressures are on young people in terms of planning, organization, organizing themselves and revising for exams that are in the future. Um, and again, that can create a lot of anxiety, even for young people who are striving to do really well because they find it difficult in the moment to apply themselves. And then they often feel conflicted about that. Um, again, noticing those differences between themselves and their peers and finding it difficult to communicate that or interact with that. And I think for some young people who may be really, you know, having questions about their identity and we see a lot of young people having questions around their kind of gender identity, their sexual identity. And, and these can be really difficult conversations to have with trusted adults, but actually really essential in order to enable those young people to have a safe space to take the risk of being vulnerable and thinking about what this means for them. Thank you, that really, really mindful and helpful comments there. So what about the positive bits? So we've, we've talked about the challenges. What do adolescents bring to the school environment that's positive? What does the adolescent brain add? And I mean, I can really comment on this having worked in schools for the last five years compared to working in, in a more constrained mental health environment. There are some things I absolutely adore about working in a school environment and they're generally driven by the young people um, so you you come up with you you describe some of the things that you think these teenage attributes um, bring to school life absolutely we've got so much to learn haven't we from young people and their view on things opening our eyes that sense of individuality and, and I think quite often as adults we move away from some of these things that are actually really important to our own well-being opportunities for creativity that spark and energy and social connection and sometimes as an adult we've moved away from those things but actually we would really value having more of them in our life the sense of adventure, you know, for some young people who are not looking at all the possibilities of things going wrong, it's really refreshing, isn't it, to see young people striving, dreaming, hoping, aspiring and being adventurous. Um, yeah, not, you know, seeing young people question, think for themselves, try and understand the world and, and all those existential questions which are so important to ask. And for many young people, they might not have a space in the home environment to have those discussions. They may not have adults who are available to them to explore some of these options. So school can become an incredibly important and valuable place for adolescents to test out some of these ideas and have these opportunity for conversations. And a lot of the work we do with parents, we remind parents of how when they're communicating with their adolescents, they're often very emotional 
suddenly involved with what their young people are talking about or the risk taking behavior and and that emotional involvement can often make it really difficult to have a conversation with us because we're often really worried about what our young people are saying we're getting kind of caught up with it emotionally and then not giving our young people the best kind of response but actually in a school environment as a teacher and, and I find this as a, as a therapist we're often in a better place to have a more helpful and neutral response to young people because we're less emotionally involved um, so yeah absolutely thinking about curiosity being able to empathize with their peers developing that confidence exuberance what a great word just seeing that bounce and zest for life and i think when we see young people presenting with low mood when we see adolescents presenting with low mood that's why it can be really difficult because it doesn't fit with all of these positive it can be a really awful thing to see a young person who is not taking any risks who isn't asking questions and seems very withdrawn um, and and so again we we want to see this in young people don't we even if it does present those challenges thank you really helpful comments and so we're going to really think now about how some of these challenges might present in the classroom and what we can do as school systems as cultures in our schools but also as individual members of staff who are who are building relationships with young people and i think if you've been to any of our other presentations you'll really have that sense that most of uh, the power of of what we can do in schools is around having and building relationships with young people so that many of these things that we're going to talk about now can can happen really so i guess what we can say is these might be some of the common struggles you might see in a classroom environment with years um, 10 and 11 um, and, and year nine as well and, and up so i guess we might find some young people finding work boring they might be disengaged it might not feel relevant to them i've been in history lessons thinking oh my goodness this con this is so interesting and and the whole group just don't seem interested at all they're more interested in talking to their peers about what happened yesterday or or, or is going to be going on at the weekend and i guess for young people um quite often some of the, the things that they're having to do in their lessons some of the curriculum they're having to learn can feel really unrelated to their current world the here and now and what we know is really and i'm going to go on to talk about how we can kind of mediate against this is that when young people are more emotionally engaged with work and it becomes more relevant to them they're much more likely to to kind of their, their kind of prefrontal cortex is more likely to be firing and they're much more likely to engage in that learning. Often we see difficult behaviour where young people might play to the audience of their peer group and it, and it might feel easier to be disruptive in the lesson um, and have the kudos of being a person who's seen as being kind of quite cool but difficult rather than um, someone who might be struggling with their work and they might need more help and they, they find that really difficult to ask for help or I guess situations where as a teacher you've had to address a difficulty and the young person's response um, may actually be about kind of trying to hide the shame or humiliation that they've got from being kind of sort of shown up in front of their peer group um, and i guess we can think about the power of peer influence and peer pressure so 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 some young people we may see a change in their behavior as they go into those years 9 10 and 11 from where they might have been in the, the young young years where they might be uh becoming part of peer groups which are actually really changing their behavior and quite often i meet with young people who are really conflicted because they want to be accepted in a peer group and they've ended up in difficult situations where they've got into trouble and they're really conflicted about having been in trouble with adults but they've also really wanted to fit in with that peer group and and what we know is if we're able to teach young people about making good choices about emotional regulation that's really a much more powerful way of helping teenagers make better choices and manage risk better than it is just letting young people know what not to do and, and, and what what risks are involved of certain choices 
So it's giving them the skills and the opportunity because, again, in the moment, their emotional brain is taking over. They're flipping their lid and they're really struggling to use that logical bit of the brain. And quite often the practice and the talking through of those problems and a lot of you on this call may well be working with young people individually having those opportunities to talk those scenarios through and come up with different choices and options so lots of young people I've worked with who are routinely getting into trouble at school um, particularly at break and lunch times we literally map out what happens at break and lunch times and how they can make different choices to move away from particular scenarios before or at the beginning of that scenario occurring and actually it's really interesting to see if you can help them come up with really concrete alternative options um, and think about the bigger picture and the consequences quite often you can see a real transformation in the choices that young person makes and then they get out of that cycle of, of, of getting stuck with, with um, difficult behaviours. Again, we know young people are incredibly sensitive to criticism and negative feedback and, and this can be really difficult if you're a teacher managing a classroom full of young people. We know if young people, teenagers are presented with neutral faces of adults, they actually view them as being angry. So even a neutral face is um, considered by a young person to be more likely to be negative and I get this all the time with my own adolescent to, at home where I've said something in what I think is a completely neutral voice and my adolescent is taking real umbrage that why am I saying it like that and I'm like I wish I had a recording because I'm pretty sure I, I said that in a neutral voice so I guess one of the things that we work with parents a lot on, and I think it's really important for teachers as well, is thinking about non-verbal body language, thinking about our facial expressions, and also thinking about our tone of voice. Um, and quite often, that can have a huge impact on what we're going to get back from a young person, because young people's brains are programmed to be super alert to threats which is why they're more sensitive to negative feedback so this is actually completely automatic response to a young person it's not something they've got any real conscious control over it's what their brain is doing to keep them safe to keep them alive um, and obviously in a school environment quite often we need to use our voice to keep control and command of our lesson of a group of a thought on group of young people um, but it's just really hope, important to hold that in mind that particularly for vulnerable young people and we've done another talk um, on working with vulnerable young people today which the recording will be available of but particularly for vulnerable young people who might have had traumatic experiences um, the tone of voice and um, can be incredibly threat raising and, and as soon as young people get into that zone they're of course their prefrontal cortex they flip their lid and they are no, no longer able to engage in learning or they might need to do something to to minimize the kind of humiliation or, or shame that they're experiencing in their lessons um, so what we know about young people is is that adolescence is that social status becomes critically important and in fact there's some research to suggest that if we talk to young people as if they are almost above us and it's a really difficult thing to do we almost need to speak to our young people with as much respect as we can as if we're talking to someone who we really um, think is incredible um, then we're much more likely to get the best out of them and that's a little bit counterintuitive certainly as well if you're dealing with difficult behavior and when I'm speaking to my adolescent at home and they've really annoyed me um, often that is actually when my young person's brain is totally going to shut down and they're not going to pay any attention. So I think these really tiny things about our behavior can have a huge impact on the response that we're going to get from young people. Um, and again, just thinking about vulnerability, you know, learning is about being vulnerable. It's about acknowledging you don't know something. It involves the risk of making a mistake. And I think one of the key things that it's so important for adolescents to do is to feel safe enough to be able to make mistakes um, so that they can essentially learn from those and creating a culture where actually 
making mistakes is, is a positive. Taking a risk and making a mistake is a positive because what it does, does is it gives us an opportunity to learn. And as adults, we can often be in a really privileged position of being a safe enough place to explore um, what could be um, the different response or their learning from having made a mistake. So holding in mind that the sensitivity to criticism, how we give feedback to young people is going to be really, really important. And I know that I've spoken to lots of teachers about feeling like, well, how is a young person going to cope with being an adult in the real world when they're going to get some really hard feedback from an employer about them not cutting it? Um, and I just think that obviously we want to prepare young people for the toughness of the real world. But we also really, I think, off the back of strong relationships with our young people, we can have honest convers and difficult conversations. Um, and, and I think that's really critical that we think about how do we build those relationships by doing some of this fir stuff first so that we can then go into that territory, which feels a bit more um, difficult so that young people can develop resilience around um, kind of truth, you know, and, and facing some of the challenges they may have and their learning areas and what they need to do next and taking that responsibility and making that commitment to working. And again, we know there's so much research on the impact of bullying and you can see how bullying during the adolescent years can be so catastrophic for young people because if being part of the social group is literally dependent your survival is dependent on it to actually not be part of the social group and to also be bullied um, is an additional um, it has a huge huge negative effect on young people's well-being not just in the moment as an adolescent but we know from the research that bullying goes on to continue to affect a young person right through into adulthood it affects their life chances and most schools have a zero tolerance policy on no, on bullying um, and I guess that's very important to think about when we think about peer influence and peer pressure, the opportunities we can create in school environments to have peer influencers so that we can have young people who can influence for good and, and can take leadership roles and support positive change in schools. Um, we know that adolescents are going to listen more to their peer group than they are to us. So how do we encourage our adolescents to engage more in teaching in, in, in kind of we think about the extracurriculum stuff when we think about PSHE? If we can get other young people talking positively about things that might be topics which are stigmatized, then that's going to be really, really valuable for those other adolescents. And, and we're trying to think about that in our work. How do we make films and videos? and how do we get other young people talking to other young people about some of this difficult stuff and giving good advice because young people will listen to other young people in a way that they will not listen to adults. So in just thinking about how can science help, um, Spencer Kagan has got some six brain-friendly principles for the classroom essentially um, and you can google um, Spencer Kagan there's a really nice article which covers this in more detail um, and essentially the idea is really to think about how do we create environments that support um, the, the challenges around adolescence and how do we encourage our adolescents and meet their needs on these different levels um, so adolescents have a, ultimately have a need to have a relationship with you as an adult to help them feel competent, to have a sense of autonomy, to, to manage their peer relationships. And, and Spencer has these six brain friendly principles that, that he argues are helpful to making um, this the classroom feel like a safe enough environment for young people to get to help young people reach their potential in the learning environment and I guess the key thing really there is safety so reducing pressure um, or the opportunity for humiliation in particular is really really important because 
we know adolescents have got short fuses. We know that they're kind of more likely to have that emotional response with the amygdala, which is going to mean they're going to flip their lid and then they're not going to be able to focus on learning. So creating opportunities for the classroom to feel a safe place, that there's opportunities for positive social interaction. And I think I, 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 I read somewhere about an educational psychologist saying, you know, actually the pressure often on young people to be able to directly answer questions where they, they maybe don't know the answer can be mediated by getting lots of pair share opportunities and trying to create positive social interaction opportunities so that young people can kind of have those chances to work together um, in the classroom. And some, some people even create a, a safe environment by being able to put background music on that kind of relaxing background music that can make that classroom feel Feel more positive and I am sure for those of you who are involved with sixth formers you will be working very differently with them in a sixth form context because they've got a little, little bit more that ability to work with less rules and kind of have a bit more freedom with those smaller groups again social encouraging the brain is so social and it's so much more for all of us it's social but in adolescence particularly so as Ellis was it was explaining um, and what we, we know is that providing opportunities for young people to learn together and have kind of more meaning through the work they're doing by the fact that they're able to work in pairs and exchange opinions and ideas is really valuable. And I'm sure you've seen opportunity, you've seen occasions in class where young people have got real topics that they're really impassioned and motivated about and trying to help them build their confidence that they can kind of share those um, is, is really, really valuable. Um, so kind of encouraging, I suppose, uh, moving away from competitive competition and competitive games in classes to more socially positive games um, can be can be really helpful. Again, emotions are, are such an important part of being an adolescent and how the brain is going to be fired and, and work. So, you know, you yourself as a teacher being enthusiastic about what you're presenting, showing some of that emotion really and trying to make the topics more meaningful and relevant to, to a young person, how it, it fits into their current, current life. And I guess if we can use different forms of media to enable us to do that, that can be really, really helpful uh, to help them engage more with the material. Again, attention. We know that multitasking is a really difficult thing to do when you're an adolescent, so trying not to create lesson plans where we're asking our young people to, to multitask um, and maybe perhaps breaking lessons into chunks and being really clear about what our expectations are in those different parts of the lesson can be can be really helpful to enable young people to maintain their attention again you know we know sitting all day isn't good for anyone. We're doing a lot of that um, in the virtual working world. And, and, you know, as teachers, you won't be doing any of that. You'll be very active and moving around. So providing opportunities to make sure our young people are getting enough food, enough water. And often I meet with lots of young people who are very anxious and they don't eat during the school day. And by the, the end of the day, they're really struggling to kind of sustain their attention and, and manage their their kind of anxiety and, and that's going to be driven by their body being in that kind of depleted state so just getting those basics right and often you know just creating movement breaks and lessons with some schools we work at they have 100 minute lessons providing the opportunity for a movement break um, is really valuable uh, not just in terms of energy, energizing the brain but helping process stress chemicals and our resilience uh, presentation we did for teachers yesterday covers that in, in a bit more detail and I guess thinking about stimulation the fifth, fifth 13 different kinds of stimuli we can use so just making sure that we keep things really alive and I think you'll you'll know if you if you've got an adolescent how they're so used to being exposed to digital stimulation whilst doing other activities you know, when we think about the multitasking bit, that isn't necessarily the best thing for our brains, but actually our children are very skilled at this. They've developed that skill way more than us because they're often watching a film, doing a bit of homework and managing to play a game. You know, I've come in, my son's got three screens on and he's convinced that he's managing all of them. Um, and I think, again, if we think about what um, Ellis was presenting earlier, I used to kind of, before lockdown, I used to think, my son's spending so much time 
doing this type of activity, having multiple screens and being in front of his computer was going to be really bad for him as a grown up. But now we've moved into this virtual world and many of us are having to juggle multiple screens, multiple tasks, meetings going on whilst also collecting information. I suddenly realised actually he's really exercising that part of his brain that will need to be able to do that, which, which I find really challenging. So I guess holding in mind that young people are in their you know, when you think about what they're exposed to in their in their daily lives outside of school and trying to give them opportunities to exercise those skills. And, and like someone said, they often teach us stuff. Um, so using them often as are the people who can research and collect information on topics. Um, often they can collect that much more quickly than us as adults because they're very used to doing that. And and giving our young people the opportunity for creative expression um, using the mediums that are meaningful and interesting to them. So quite often young people who might be quite disengaged, um, if you are going to ask them to make a film about something or use some of the technology they're really familiar with using, they, with the right encouragement, because often young people lack that confidence, can actually create things that we would, we, we would be really amazed by and we can really celebrate with them and their, their classmates. And I guess that kind of sense of celebration and opportunities for, for really enabling young people to have that creative energy in class, I think is so important because often the school environment really drains that um, out of young people and doesn't give them that opportunity. So really just thinking about what we as adults need to remember when we're kind of working with young people, we really talk about how with younger children, we kind of are managing them, we're organizing their day, their life, we're kind of keeping, especially if you're, you're a parent of a young person, but actually as we're going into adolescence, we're moving towards actually coaching young people, expecting them to take more responsibility, have more autonomy, and us to be in the background as their coaches. And I think that idea of moving from manager to coach is really helpful because there's a degree of uh, respect there, which is a change in the dynamic and the equality of kind of power. Um, and also there's a kind of sense of when you're coaching somebody you're kind of expecting them to take the lead but you're providing them with that support you're there to kind of give um, give guidance really when when needed to help that person reach their potential um, and that can feel really, really difficult di not difficult sorry really different from managing a young person um, and I think you probably might notice that if you're teaching across the age range. And, and one of the things that I find really sad, actually, when I've worked with groups of young people is if you're work group, working with groups of year seven and year eight, you really find that their contribution to answering questions is so much more vitality, actually. They're so much less inhibited by the response of their peer group. When you're moving into those older groups and, and hold in mind that when I'm doing group work, it's with, you know, maybe 12 to 15 young people and we're talking about topics like managing your well-being and anxiety. So they are kind of quite high stake topics and they're quite emotive topics and they're, 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 they're not neutral. But what I really observe is in those younger age groups, you get young people who are just really contributing, really turning to, to kind of joining in with the group and being really honest about what's going on for them and with the older groups that's so much more difficult and often with the group work if I'm running an eight session group I find within set one session the young groups are really firing and they're just sharing stuff straight away with those older age groups it is based on the relationship that they have with me as the kind of facilitator of that group but also the other members of the, the, the young people in that group. And so I just think it's really important to remember that because sometimes it can feel like there's a lot of creativity that kind of is lost in those older age groups, um, depending on the context, because they're so much more inhibited around sh sharing their viewpoint in front of a peer group. Um, and I guess our relationship with young people is going to be so important to enable them to in a classroom context feel like they can contribute that they can take those risks that they can uh, be part of a bit more of a creative di dynamic um, and 
I guess what we know is for young people, what is more important to them than the information you're sharing with them is the respect that they feel for you and the respect that you feel for them. So respect trumps information. So you might have a lesson with the best content in the world, but if your delivery of your relationship with that group isn't quite right, that can actually not, it can fall on deaf ears essentially. So investing in that, it, it can be really difficult, especially if you sometimes can have really difficult year groups to manage. And I guess there's something about maybe reaching out to individuals and having those small interactions with um, some of those young people you may be feeling it's really difficult to engage with. And I've often had to do that with the groups that I've been working with. That if I feel like there's a real challenge with some with the dynamic with certain members of the group. I've often had to kind of work on that relationship outside of the group time and meet with that young person and kind of often explain what might, might how it feels like to be in that lesson with them behaving like that and, and how we can work collaboratively together to change the cycle that we might have got on got into and again you know we know that forcing young people is just not going to work but that doesn't mean to say we don't give up so persisting and and continuing to to try and those relationships is really important. I know that I'm about running out of time, so I'm going to have to whiz through. So that, that principle of connecting before correcting is really important. How we communicate, I talked about earlier, um, our verbal and nonverbal language, body language, um, and just holding in mind that sometimes we may, need to do some of the correction outside of the lesson on an individual basis, not in front of others. And we often talk about rupture and repair and how critical and important repair is for young people. Um, and those opportunities can often build, give us chances to build stronger relationships. Okay, now this is on how to have difficult conversations with students. And I recognize I've been talking for too long, completely my fault, I always do this. So we do have another video which we cover this for parents. And I guess the most important thing of this slide I would say is, is strike while the iron is cold. So if you've got a young person who's in front of you, who's flipped their lid, their amygdala's fully, fully or, or, you know, kind of in control, you're not going to be able to have those really collaborative, helpful conversations about what's going on. So having those conversations at the right time is so critical. Managing those difficulties and the repair bit really happens when the young person is not in that hyper aroused state and when you're not in that hyper aroused state. So I know it's really difficult timing in, in, in schools and, and lessons because your, your day is so restricted. But if you've got particular young people you might be struggling with or particular classes that you think this dynamic is having an impact, it's really thinking about how you manage that when, when things are calm at the right time and the right space for you and for that student. Okay, so really what we cover this very briefly, our teenagers, if they are educated and they know about that, what's going on in their brains, can really help make sense of things for them. And there's actually a BBC bite size um, piece on this, which I've included at the link in the resources at the end, which we can share with young people. There's also a video clip that I've embedded in the presentation, which when you get this PowerPoint, you can watch at your own leisure. And it's something you, you can share with other teachers as well. It's only three minutes, but it kind of captures a lot of what we've covered in an hour. So that's the video, which you can, you can access with the resources. And I, we're not going to have time for you to write a letter to your students, but it's just a helpful thing to think if you were going to write a letter, what would you like them to know? And then I guess the last, state, last statement is really adolescents who are absorbing negative messages about who they are and what is expected of them may sink to that level instead of realising their true potential. As Johann Wolfgang wrote, treat people as if they were what they ought to be and you help them to become what they are capable of being. And I think that quote from Dan Siegel is really helpful, um, especially when we might be working with young people who are really pushing us and testing us to, to our limits as well. Okay. So sorry that we've run over by a few minutes and weren't able to cover those last slides in as much detail. 
as I would have planned. Um, it would be really helpful for us to know, for those of you who are logged on to Slido, um, if you found the session helpful. We, we definitely use your feedback to guide what we do. This is the first time we've run this session for teachers um, and school staff. Um, and again, we, we, we build our um, we build our program around what works for you. Um, so, so this feedback is really helpful for us in terms of, of working on developing our program. Thank you, that's really helpful. And our very last slide is, what are the two things you're going to take away from this session? And this is really helpful to us because sometimes we're asked to do condensed sessions and we'll know not to take those two things out because we generally have consensus on that. And it's also really helpful for you because we know human behavior is if you are able to think about something you might do differently within the next 24 hours, you're much more likely to, to, to do that. So great, thank you. So the brain friendly principles from John, oh, not John Spencer, so, sorry, I'm getting mixed up with someone from yesterday, more understanding, encouraging better interaction with our students. So Spencer Keegan's brain friendly principles are helpful, thank you, that's good. And you, you can Google him um, as well. Um, so thank you so much for your time today. I really hope you have a good term ahead of you. There's lots of uncertainty. We just recorded a podcast actually, which is available. It will be available on YouTube. We've got lots of other material which is available on the NSFT YouTube channel. And we recorded a podcast with a, with a teacher and a 19 year old student who's just about to go to university earlier in the week about the coming term and the feelings of mixed feelings of anxiety and um, uncertainty, as well as excitement. So it would be great if you if you were wanting to listen to that podcast because um, it's it's nice to sometimes listen to conversations with people who and hearing the different perspectives of young people uh, as well as parents. So thank you again for your for your feedback and your participation today and. Um, please do look at that YouTube channel for um, any other future, future recordings that might be helpful for you.